Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union. What's happening with human rights around the world on ThinkTech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Akea. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper, and the title of today's episode is Strategic Litigation to Save Lives, Stand Up and Strategize to Save Ukraine. I'm so fortunate to have Anna joining me today to share the important work she does as a strategic litigation lawyer with Ukrainian Helsinki Human Rights Union but I'm very honored that she would actually share her story with us today about the occupation of her city of Hostomel and its impact it's had on her life as the invaders destroyed many aspects of the beautiful culture of Ukraine. Anna, thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, thank you for having me. Good morning and good day, good evening for everybody. <laughs> yes. Um, so I think I'm going to start with the um, as, as a lawyer but as in, um, uh, nearby Kiev, 10 kilometers away. And um, my family also lived there. So and uh, in the early morning of 21st February, um, around six o'clock, six and thirty a.m. I was having my breakfast, and I got a message from my friends about uh, the Putin's uh, announce about the special, so-called special operation of Ukraine, and that was mean for me that the 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 real war uh, had been started. And uh, that day, I um, I saw Russian helicopters flying very close to the land over our houses. And I also saw the black uh, um, smoke in the area of uh, international airport Antonov. Maybe you have heard. That was really strat strategically important for Russians to siege this object uh, military, to, 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 to have and bomb Kyiv from this place. Uh, so my family was scared and uh, they, they were shocked. They didn't expect this. So they, did, they didn't want to leave their homes that day. But fortunately, uh, my, my husband wanted and uh, we managed to leave, leave Hastamel um, around 10 p.m. with our pets and uh, taking all, all these necessary things. So in my head, I said goodbye to my house. And uh, after, I think, one week, and then we, uh, one week later, my neighbors called me and said that my house was destroyed. Uh, meanwhile, my grandmother, my father, my father's wife, and my nine-year-old brother, they stayed in And uh, in the early morning of um, 25th uh, February, and the bridge, the, the two bridge that leading to the key were blown up to be close to my house. So I thought like uh, we were lucky. It's and um, because of uh, very constant hostilities, the electricity, the gas, and other communications, um, so that was really good. Anna? Yes, I'm here. Sorry. No problem. I know it's it's under heinous conditions and circumstances. Just wanted to make sure you're okay. But please continue. And our heart goes out to you, the thought of having to leave your home. And then hearing, of course, homes are always the place that we consider that space where you retreat to. And then hearing that it's been bombed. But if you can still continue and the internet's okay, please keep sharing about Postumal City and, and your family and what happened next? Yeah, so as I said, the, the, the Hassamal uh, was really cut off Kyiv uh, on, on 25 February. And it was, and the, and the Russian vehicles came uh, into Hassamal. And so I think the Hassamal was occupied uh, from the 25th Hassamal and until 2nd April. However, no official information 
both from the Ukrainian government and Russian government, we don't have both the time lapse of occupation. So one day, uh, the 2nd March, uh, my, uh, my father's wife with my nine-year-old brother, they try and to leave Hostomel uh, to get place uh, warm and safe place. And they were driving on their red small car. And once they reached the street, Leontovica leading to airport and tunnel. The car was shot instantly, uh, immediately. Uh, my father's wife died immediately. My little brother was wounded. She's uh, he's stuck in the car and he couldn't uh, get out from the car. Uh, and some very good people are very thankful and um, will be thankful for, for the whole of life. They they risking their life yeah they saved my brother they took him out of the car and sheltered uh and yeah and sheltered um that's very good that we have uh, we had some connections and we had an opportunity and we could speak a little bit one minute maybe per day and uh, for a week my brother he was hidden in different in three different places with different people um yeah, alone. Before my father managed to to found him, so then they were reunited. Uh, I think it was nine March. Yeah, nine 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 March, and they could uh, leave Hostomel um, on eleven March uh, by um, car convoy. So that was not a green corridor, but it was earlier earlier than green corridor. However, you know that um, any green corridor that have been in Ukraine, they are not they, they are, there was no guarantee for safe. So a lot of people died during green corridors. So yeah, that's 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 that is what I know. And also I know that uh, one of the cases we are working on that our mayor, mayor of our city, he was also killed with his com comrades while uh, Mm, delivering food and uh, and uh, some stuff that just uh, well volunteering yeah so yeah now the Russians they didn't follow any uh, humanitarian rules international humanitarian uh, norms rules and uh, they. They, 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 they left mines in the dead corpses in Hastamal. As bridges can still believe. And, there. and of course, our city is destroyed out of buildings. Yes. That's not only about Hastamal, but also Bucha, Irpin. We are really close, three cities. Uh, and uh, we are really now afraid uh, for the second attempt. But I think our government uh, is now more ready for this. Yes, it's, it's, it's what we see every day unfolding, but it's so important to hear from you directly about what's happening in your homeland, in your community, and more importantly, to be able to, to share exactly how Russia is violating international humanitarian law and be able to hear directly from you in the work that you do. And we also know the strategic litigation that the Ukrainian Helsinki Human Rights Union is gathering this kind of information. But the sad part, of course, is that it's happening to you and to all of your neighbors. And so maybe you could share with us a bit more about the work of Ukrainian Helsinki Human Rights Union, why it was created and what it does, and then we can also see how important that is going forward to then make sure that hopefully no one else will ever be invaded again, and the theme of never again be more than just a slogan for social justice, but a reality in international public law. Yes. Mm. Um, for First of all, I would like to know that our organization is really big, 
this is like an association, not organization, but an association of different human rights organization. Um, and in this sense, and, and therefore, this is the biggest human rights organization in Ukraine. So we also have some um, uh, part in, uh, in uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. Anna, thank you so much. I know we lost Sorry you there. Again. No, um, it, it, we know it's, it's horrendous conditions, but we thank you so much for making time. And we had been sharing your website. So you can continue again. I know you're talking about being an association and really an umbrella of many NGOs demanding and organizing for universal values that of course are also important to the people of Ukraine. So we can just start there with the work of the association and then maybe we can get into if there is a typical day, what are some of the main projects and actions that you're taking regarding this current conflict that has begun. And of course, building on the example that you shared with us with the personal project story as well. Um, yeah, so <laughs> with of a lot of different directions. Um, the um, educational programs for people, for teachers, for um, for judges, for advocates to 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 maintain their uh, to increase their knowledge of uh, human rights. Uh, the second is uh, documenting um, human rights violations and especially war crimes. Yeah, this project and this center was created in uh, 2014 and um, the center was to be closed, I think in December, but the, now we know that we are also, we are also again is looking for the staff for this uh, center. And also this center um, wrote, has wrote um, the stories and the guides, not the guides, but the, the little books, yeah, about history of uh, different uh, cities in the Eastern of Ukraine. Um, explaining um, the the chronology of military action hostilities and the military and the war crimes that ha had been uh, committed on that territories, uh, the strategic litigation center where I work. Uh, uh, so we are focused on European Court of Human Rights. Uh, also, we have um, um, the local uh, local offices. Uh, where our lawyers uh, provide free legal aid and cons cons uh, consultations uh, for people. So everybody from the street can just come and give uh, the consultation on different uh, um, legal issues and problems. So that's our main project. <laughs> Uh, we were in, in global, yeah, and also um, we are. We were also. We have the people who the specialists who work in um, on um, uh, advocating um, advocating a law and uh, provide expert um, ex, uh, um, assessments of uh, law amendments, yeah, and proposal some projects, draft law, something like this. Now also, but I'm only, we, we are a very big organization, more than 100 people, I think. So I'm more focused on my strategic litigation center. And now we also have a lot of new projects. For example, we run the um, reviews of uh, everything is okay with internet. Yes. No. So, good point. I hear you. I hear you, and we very much want to hear about maybe two areas. Can you share with us the examples of war crimes that you have been able to document? What are the most 
serious ones. And then maybe we can expand a bit into what you talked about with some of those new initiatives that you were describing that you're working on. Those would both be very fascinating for the world to be, know about. Yes. Um, I think for me, the most terrible war crimes is the, war, the, war, the, the, war, the crimes conserving children raping children and then killing children. And we have such accidents and such cases in Bucha that's close to Hastamal. Yes, and that's not only girls, but also little boys. So yeah, I think these types of crime are the most. Because as you know, like children are the most, I think, the most uh, um, protectable under international humanitarian law, and uh, that's unimaginable how they could treat them like this. Yes, and also a lot of uh, what I, uh, uh, what I. Uh, uh, the main the the fixed uh, in the months ago is the mo the most of the uh, crimes is the the sh shooting of the cars and shooting the civilians just shooting. and the people who die in uh, in the houses uh, as a result of bombing that was my the most of the crimes I uh, have documented. No, we, we have heard many people now will never forget the word of Buka, but they don't know the map of Ukraine. So you being able to share how close you live and also some specific examples of the violations of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, but also humanitarian law that, that children, of course, have a, a special protection because of their vulnerability. And as you shared, that there was rape of young girls and women, but then also of boys and just the brutality of the actions against innocent civilians who have done nothing or are just trying to survive while Putin is increasing his attacks. And of course, letting and encouraging the soldiers where we saw he gave an award to some of the soldiers battalion that had done some of the most brutal documented violations of humanitarian law. So we. We thank you so much, Anna, for being able to share with us. And the other point that you were talking about was you were actually getting into some of the new strategic litigation initiatives that you're taking, and those are, are equally important. And as we look at, at, at what is going on, uh, we, we thank you so much for being able to stay with us during this time and we can hear you uh, and we will be able to make this work well because people around the world do want to know what's happened. We know that many people were trapped in Mariupol and you're just getting the information now. We know also that the corridors you're describing are not accessible. We've even heard that people are forced to go to Russia and that the only corridor to leave a city where the bombing and violence is taking place is to go into Russia, which of course no one would willingly want to go after experiencing what you have shared of your home being bombed, of your brother and father being attacked and her, his partner being murdered there. So we thank you so much for, for taking the time to share with us about the ongoing Russian attacks in Ukraine, even blocking the World Food Program from reaching besieged cities with nutritional aid, and disrupting any food that's even going to other parts of the world. So if you do want to share and you can about some of the new actions that you're taking, we agree with you as well as with Secretary General Guterres that war is evil. And we know there's more actions that we're documenting to cooperate with the International Criminal Court, but, but please give us some insights to the important works that, that you do. 
I'm sorry for the change like location. I hope uh, you can see me. It's but... fine. Absolutely. So thank you. As long as you're safe, it's most important. Okay, so first of all, everyone uh, of our center is writing legal articles um, because the legislations uh, are, are changed on very almost every day, and there are a lot of new rules. So, yes, the second one uh, we uh, we created an instruction. Uh, how to on how to apply to European Court of Human Rights, uh, not only for the lawyer, but also that uh, the, the, this is instruction is quite simple, and every person could uh, follow the instruct the instructions and uh, and submit an application. So we developed uh, uh, the drafts of typical situations. Yeah, murder and forced uh, disappearance, arbitrary detention, torture, property damage, and also we uh, create uh, we uh, we provided uh, in this instruction with uh, um, drafts of crime reports to both to Ukrainian and Russian law enforcement agencies. And uh, moreover, we are now, now working on the chat bot, uh, which will uh, which is supposed to create uh, an application to the European Court of Human Rights uh, on the algorithms based on the uh, on the information provided by the applicant on the messengers. Um, we also have uh, we also continued documenting documenting war crimes um, together with other organization and in order to to forward this information to the International Criminal Court. Court. We have project um, on um, Ukraine, about Ukrainian war prisoners and also about Russian war prisoners, prisoners. But here I want to stress that we don't protect them, uh, but we rather looking for the evidence of the war crimes uh, for, um, in which this particular uh, war Russian prisoners may be involved in order to um, to proceed um, the criminal investigations. And uh, this information may also be forwarded to the uh, foreign law enforcement agencies because some of the European countries, they have uh, quite good implementation of uh, universal jurisdiction principle, and uh, they are already started and they are already launched their own criminal proceedings. And we do appreciate this very much because you never know when the uh, where the suspect person will appear, yeah, <laughs> and when. So yeah, also we have um, everybody works on indivi individual uh, cases. Um, this work contains uh, questioning applicants, witnesses, uh, collecting evidence, uh, filling uh, crime reports uh, within Ukrainian and Russian law enforcement agencies, and uh, filling um, applications, uh, complaints to the European Co Court of Human Rights, and also requests on the Rule uh, 39 of the Rule of the Court for interim measures. And this um, mechanism is uh, the most um, relevant to the, to the name of the topic of this stream, I think, because especially this procedure can um, affect and change the situation promptly. For example, I would like to tell you about uh, the, the rule 39 about hostomel. Um, on, uh, yeah, on 9, 9th uh, March, the European Court of Human Rights um, made the uh, rule um, decision on interim measures and indicated Russian government to ensure free access 
of the civilians uh, to the green corridors. And uh, I don't know, maybe this is this is this is not linked, but uh, on the nine uh, this, the day before, uh, the first green corridor was announced for Hastomel. So maybe this was just accident. I don't know. No, we appreciate it. It's a good point to show the rule of law and to show the creativity behind the strategic yeah. litigation. We appreciate you talking about the International Criminal Court at the global level, but many people are not aware of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, and it's great for you to get into specific articles that you are, but then also your aspect of national universal jurisdiction at the national level. We know Germany just prosecuted a case in Syria, so all of the arsenal of advocacy that you're doing is absolutely important. And it's true, maybe we might not be able to measure exactly, but we know we must combine all of the opportunities to organize to ensure the rule of law. I know we're running out of time today, Anna, but we would definitely like to continue the conversation when you have more time. And we thank you so much for sharing with us the important work of your association. And we thank you for your bravery and all the work that you're doing, that even when you see what is happening all around you, you still stand up for human rights and we applaud your bravery and we're sending aloha from Hawaii. Thank you so much for having and for your attention to Ukraine. Please keep doing this. Thank you. Thank you. And we will keep reporting and monitoring how we're able to use international humanitarian law, focusing on war crimes and crimes against humanity but also the international human rights mechanisms that exist at the global as well as the regional level. And I do agree with you that the universal jurisdiction claims is very true because you never know where those soldiers who have committed those crimes might be in the future. But what you're doing is, is laying a precedence that if anyone ever thinks they can invade another country and operate without any consequences, that we'll make sure that law is as strong as possible to know that they will have their day in the court of law. And we know now it's definitely happening in the court of public opinion around the world as the world stands in solidarity with you and your people as you fight for freedom. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Aloha, bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.